Dame i gospodo, dobro jutro. Pozivam profesora Vladimira Kostića, predsednika Srpske akademije nauka i umetnosti i kopredsednika programskog odbora Svetske konferencije o osnovnim naukama i održivom razvoju da se obrati skupu. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm inviting, I have invited Professor Vladimir Kostić, President of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts and Co-Chair of the Program Committee of the World Conference on Basic Sciences and Sustainable Development to take the floor, please. Poštovani akademici, poštovani predsedavajući, dame i gospodo, veliko mi je zadovoljstvo što mogu da izrazim dobrodošlicu učesnicima ovog skupa pod krom Srpske akademije nauke i umetnosti i sada bi se u nastavku obratio učesnicima na englesku. It is a great pleasure to welcome you under the roof of the Serbian Academy of Arts and Scientists. I want to say a few words if you give me this opportunity. Faced with an array of issues including the problems of science we are witnessing an ever-increasing acceleration which does not allow for stepping aside and a more serious break for reflection and understanding of what is happening to us. To put it simply, we are shifted to the time of instant attitudes and flash decisions. This is one of the reasons why the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Art, an institution only little over 180 years old, expresses satisfaction with the fact that it is a co-organizer of the meeting entitled World Conference of the Basic Sciences and Su Sustainable Development. As you know, this is the same uh, nomination of the year, which we perceive as an opportunity to participate in an attempt to, uh, albeit briefly, of course, draw a line and establish current balances in the face of uncertain future. Even if it is regarded the existential fears, the very body of science shows some cracks that we, it seems to me, failed to reconcile successfully. Let me name only a few of my own choice, not necessarily the most important ones. How to oppose the undoubtedly harm harmful, but quite inevitable, division into two cultures, humanistic and scientific in the future? Should we persist in the view that all scientific challenges are crossing interdisciplinary and that the social sciences and humanities probably have a key role to play in bridging the gap between different disciplines. And here we approach the second problem. Is the post-academic university labeled as a clumsy amalgamation of medieval academic ritual specialization, open and reckless denial of the role of social sciences in modern societies, managerism and superficiality, actually a playground for strong pressures of various, particularly technocratic forces, primarily towards market-oriented forms of determination and of fatalism, which leave no room for ideas of any alternative for critical thinking, the ethics of scientific and artistic work, and self-examination. And as you know, the absence of doubt equals the absence of scruples. Gibbons was among the first to warn against the deconstruction of the very idea of science. New paradigms of knowledge production are primarily characterized by the importance of context, not only in terms of the final application of science, defining scientific problems and choosing an adequate methodology, <coughs> sorry, but through the definition of relevant, usable knowledge that is, as the author says, socially robust. I don't like these words, social, socially robust. Please forgive me, since I'm an older man, for a certain conservatism and sentimentality, but I do not like the question of the cynical philosopher who says that I'm sitting, quotation, everyone is allowed if he wants to study the heated language, black holes, the difference between St. Cyprian and St. Augustine in the interpretation of the sacrament of baptism or Japanese Zen gardens, but why should the taxpayer pay for, pay for it? If such utilitarianism prevails, would it at some as some predict, mean the downfall of the university and to a considerable extent, civilization itself. It is a witty statement, despite the fact that the university and scientific institutions serve to transmit and improve all the technical abilities on which the life of civilization depends, that they are also the institutionalized form 
of that special human biological property, curiosity. Curiosity is a spontaneous reflex, the ability to know the world for the sake of knowing. Eisenberg, a few years ago, does not hide his conviction that the government and industry should consciously provide funding for the production of knowledge for the sake of knowledge, and thus even more cynically points to the benefit of, as he say, useless knowledge. As for our meeting, some titles among all these great topics, some key words make me especially happy. Let me say, scientific research as a promoter of intercultural dialogue and peace. Though I'm aware that this is not the case at the very moment, especially not today. How to make wiser use of science to promote biodiversity, conservation, and ecological civilization. Science and education for peace and sustainable future, but also on a perspective of our survival. Why? Well, because it seems to me that the authentic responsibility of thinking people can be seen behind such titles, just as it seems to me that behind the sustainable picking <coughs> true is our fear that we have brought both our planet and our own civilization to the point close to a point of no return. <coughs> it seems that contrary to Habermas' statement, science will have to think after all. In this sense, I really wish you all successful work as the host, but considering that you are in the city where civilization met in the most literal sense, I also hope that you will use the time for mutual communication and meetings. Believe me, it is difficult to find a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kostic. Now it is my pleasure to invite Professor Mariana Dukic Mijatovic, State Secretary for the Education, Science and Technological Development of the Republic of Serbia, to open the conference. It should be emphasized that the Government of Serbia seriously recognized the importance of basic sciences for sustainable development as seriously supported the event. Professor Dukic Mijatovic, please. Thank you. Your uh, Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and uh, gentlemen, on behalf of the Government of the Republic of Serbia and the Ministry of Education, Science and Technological Development of the Republic of Serbia, I am pleased to welcome you all in Belgrade in Serbia. It is my great pleasure to open World Conference on Basic Sciences and Sustainable Development and to greet you in the name of the First Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Education, Science and Technological Development of Serbia, Mr. Branko <coughs> Ružić. We are glad to have the opportunity to host this important conference in Belgrade as one of the main events in International Year of Basic Science, Sciences for Sustainable Development 2022, and to see you all in person uh, after this long period of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In the past 10 years, our country has become a place where new innovative projects and solutions are developed research and development and innovation centers, business and technology incubators and science and technology parks are established, which represents a place where young people can present and realize their innovative ideas in practice. The government of the Republic of Serbia and the Ministry of Education, Science and Technological Development has taken significant steps toward the reform of science and research system aimed at improving their excellence and relevance for the economic development. Some of the milestones in that respect were the law on science and research adopted on July 2019 and law on science fund adopted in December 2018. The adoption of this law were the key step in the reform of the system of organization and financing of science in the ensure of the conditions for a continuous development of scientific research and 
uh, and uh, development activities in Serbia necessary for the knowledge-based social progress. This reform is followed by increased investment in research activities throughout this, the year. For example, in a period from 2015 to 2019, uh, uh, the investment was increased by 36%. In the previous period, the government of the Republic of Serbia adopted a number of strategic documents which are uh, the foundation and direction for the improvement of, of innovative and scientific activities. I will only mention the strategy of scientific and technological development called the power of knowledge, the strategy of smart special specialization, and the strategy for the development of startup ecosystem and uh, uh, of the Republic of Serbia. Adoption of the law on the science fund ensured the establishment of new institutions in our system, the fund itself, but but uh, um, uh, we'll develop different programs to support the best quality scientists, best quality ideas, and thus ensure further development of the science of the Republic of Serbia. The new law of innovation activity adopted in December 2021 creates the necessary preconditions for the inclusion of the innovation system of the Republic of Serbia in the European Research Area and the Innovation Union in a way that the innovation system is directed towards research that results in innovation products and process economic and social development. As you all know, all that mentioned is the key to create a technologically advanced and economically successful society. The Science Fund and the previously established Innovation Fund provide financial support to scientific research organizations and the economy for the development of innovations. For example, Science Fund financed 282 projects and 1,737 uh, scientists with budget of approximately 44 million, million euro. And Innovation Fund financed 1,439 uh, projects with budget approximately 54 uh, million euros. In addition to reforming the science funding system, the ministry, ministry has done a lot of to rejuvenate Serbian scientific community by involving 1,951 young researchers in the ministry projects within the first five public calls on the current scientific programs led by scientific institutions. The regional network of science and technological parks at four locations, Belgrade, Novi Sad, Čačak and Niš, was created as a space that allows companies and talents from around the world to connect with universities and innovation companies in Serbia. These science and technological park offer product development lab laboratories, a network of mentors stimulating business environment, networking with potential investors, opportunities for knowledge exchange, and full support in the implementation of all supporting activities required for faster development. I would like to underline that uh, the investment in the science and research infrastructure. Around 60 million euros for the construction of these uh, science and technological parks. Five, five million euros for the construction of apartments for young scientists in Kragujevac. 155 million euros for building uh, of uh, 15 faculties. Then 14 million euros for the construction of Biosense Institute and 5 million euros for the construction of Parochial Center of the Institute of Physics in Belgrade. When it comes to investment in infrastructure, we should add the following, the uh, furnishing uh, center of excellence university in Kragujevac, and to make a higher impact of the infrastructural support, the ministry adopted a roadmap for research infrastructure in December 2018. In the previous period, a number of new institutes were established. The government of the Republic of Serbia established uh, the Genome Sequencing and Biotechnology Center with the Institute of Molecular Genetic and Genetic Engineering in Belgrade. The foundation of the Genome Sequencing and Biotechnological Center represents the strategic projects of the Republic of Serbia, which is carried out through the cooperation with the, with the Beijing Genomic Institute and which follows up the uh, construction of work of Fire Eye, National Laboratories for Molecular Detection of Inspection Seconds in Belgrade and Niche, and which consequently has increased the capacity for SARS uh, COVID 2 testing in the Republic of Serbia. 
Upon the initiative of the Ministry of the Construction of Bayer 4 Campus, Biomedicine, Biotechnology, Bioinformatics, Biodiversity, Serbia as a new Biomedicine and Biotechnology Hub in Europe, the Government declared the project of the construction of this campus as of national importance with budget of 200 million euros. This project includes constructing the infrastructure that will support the application of modern technology, special research, modern education, and interaction between the academy and business. At the moment, the blueprint of master plan of uh, Bayer 4 Institute, as well as the de uh, defining of the space capacity, are, doing, uh, are being done. In Novi Sad, the building of the Biosense Institute is being completed with the Horizon Project Antares, aimed to involve Biosense Institute into the European Center of Excellence for Advanced Technologies in Sustainable Agriculture and to deliver uh, disruptive digital solutions to European uh, farming sector. Boost research excellence, stimulate entrepreneurship and employment at regional level and secure in, uh, enough safe food for a growing global population. The fourth industrial revolution mentioned for the first time in uh, 2015 has developed on the achievement of the digital revolution and is characterized by the technologies that uh, link physical, biological and uh, digital sphere. Serbia recognized the importance of artificial and intelligence in time and uh, it is first country in the region of Southeast Europe to adopt the strategy for the development of artificial intelligence. On 19 March 2021, the government has made a decision on establishing the Institute for Artificial Intelligence Research and Development in Novi Sad, which uh, will deal with research uh, referring to application of artificial intelligence in different fields with a distinct multidisciplinary approach and in cooperation with scientific and research institutions in a field of application and with economic and public sector. Progress is not possible without continuous access to new scientific knowledge and opportunities for collaboration with scientists and innovators around the world. The evidence that Serbia is already part of, of European Union in the field of education in science is the fact that uh, first negotiating chapters uh, that were opened were also closed. Chapter 20. Five science and research on 13 December in 2016 and chapter 26 education and culture on 27 February 2017. For Serbia, participation in the programs of European Union is crucial. As part of the research area, numerous opportunities have been opened up for, uh, for us within the Horizon 2020 program. In the Horizon 2020 program, according to the recent data, we have 596 participants in more than 414 signed grants. And our institutions have contracted almost 135 million euros. Serbia average success rate is close to the European Union average. In addition, we have access to IPA pre-accession funds of European Union through which we can raise the capacity of the scientific research community and innovation ecosystem at the national level. Additionally, we actively participate in work concern in which we become a full member in 2018 and we also negotiate full membership in the Joint Institute for Nuclear a research in Dubna in accordance with roadmap that we signed in 2009. We hope that the mentioned reform support from the SAGE project and the investment will contribute to a more efficient national research system, which stands for the first of six priority fields of European research area. And that is, will serve us as a good foundation for a better placement in the Horizon Europe program. Finally, I wish you successful work at conference, I'm sure that conclusions of the conference will assist in finding some of the answers to the key question of sustainable development. Also, I would like to draw your attention to the poster section. The authors of the posters are nine young scientists awarded with, uh, within for Women in Science, national program in Serbia, established by the company L'Oreal Balkan, Commission of Serbia for Cooperation with UNESCO, and the Ministry of Education, Science and Technological Development of Serbia. Thank you for attention.
Thank you, Professor Dukic Mijatovic. Thus, we can consider that the conference is open. We shall now hear four inaugural talks of the conference. The first speaker will be Dr. Amal Kasri from the Natural Science Sector of UNESCO. Dr. Kasri, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this kind invitation to UNESCO to be part of this uh, very important and interesting conference in Serbia. Uh, it's my first time in Belgrade, so I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much. So, uh, actually, uh, this talk was supposed to be given by my colleague, uh, Ezra Clark, as the director, uh, the acting director of the Division of uh, Science Policy and Basic Science. Unfortunately, he was hit by COVID suddenly, and uh, I am uh, giving this uh, talk on his behalf. Uh, actually, I will give another talk later, so you will listen to me twice today, so uh, this is really a great opportunity for me. Uh, uh, the natural science sector at UNESCO uh, is actually um, uh, one of the main sectors that started with the, with the beginning of UNESCO since uh, 1946, uh, and we uh, work for promoting peace through science. So, if you look at the, um, uh, if you want to uh, imagine uh, or have a vision for science uh, or a vision actually for world at peace, so I don't think you can imagine this world to be without basic science. Uh, science is, is the tool that enable us to develop uh, agriculture, to make food available, to, to, make, to secure energy, to secure water. All this is done through science and consequently uh, science is important for peace, and this is what we try to do at UNESCO. Uh, UNESCO, as you all know, was established in 1946. <clears throat> uh, currently, it has 193 member states, and its main objective, as I just explained, is to contribute to peace and the security in the world uh, through education, science, culture, and communication. Uh, and we work as laboratories of ideas, as a catalyst to, uh, uh, to inter for intergovernmental and international uh, science programs. Uh, we do this uh, through uh, different tools, as I said. So um, uh, we have been playing a big role, actually, since the beginning. And uh, for this, uh, we, have, um, we have the inter international and inter intergovernmental uh, programs in the field of water, basic science, uh, biosphere reserves and uh, geoscience. Um, we do a lot of recommendations through these international and intergovernmental programs. I'm going to speak more uh, in more details about this uh, in a few minutes. We do this also through huge, through huge network of category two centers under the auspices of UNESCO and also UNESCO chairs who are eminent scientists in different fields. Uh, we also do, we have our global uh, partners like the, to us, the World Academy of Science and the International Center of Theoretical Physics, which is a category one center. Uh, all this actually are important tools helping us to uh, achieve um, our goals. Um, in order to, uh, to do a good job in, in, in our, uh, or, or actually uh, achieving our goals and, and uh, being and contributing to sustainable development, we have to look first at the challenges, the most important challenges facing us. These challenges are, uh, examples of them are uh, failure of climate change, mitigation and adaptation, natural, science, natural disasters, uh, specifically the man-made environmental disasters, biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse, and water crisis. These are main challenges that we are now focusing on. So in order to find solutions, we have to analyze these challenges carefully. Due to this, we have, uh, uh, due to these challenges, actually, there are a lot of pressure on uh, natural resources. Uh, there is also um, uh, many conflicts are being created, uh, which may, might lead to violence, actually, because uh, there is uneven distribution of resources which affects people <clears throat> everywhere. Uh, there is also a uh, bigger chance of losing jobs, and uh, because easily or normally people get replaced because there is no 
uh, resources, enough resources for everyone. So that's why it is really dangerous and we have to, be, to pay a lot of attention uh, <coughs> to address these challenges. Uh, in order to, to do this, there are several, several uh, routes to do that, and we follow uh, uh, two of them, among others, of course. First, uh, science diplomacy is one way to um, initiate discussions, uh, and we do this through several programs. For example, SESAMI. Uh, some of you might know SESAMI, the synchrotron facility in the Middle East in Jordan. Um, and also global uh, report on biodiversity, water diplomacy, all this uh, contribute to or help us to address uh, some of the challenges. Also, uh, the uh, inter uh, international normative framework in science technology <coughs> and innovation. So, if you look at uh, the technology and the knowledge gaps that we have right now, we have many gaps actually. In order to close these gaps, we have to develop uh, science, technology, and the innovation policies, and also to build the capacities in all member states. Um, global governance in, in, in STI need uh, uh, monitoring the trends and development, and for this we can use the science diplomacy, and we need to collect also the data regularly everywhere. Uh, we estimate that by 2030, we need about 30 million researchers in, and engineers. And that's why we need to uh, engage youth in science and engineering. Um, currently, we have a big problem with the, uh, the average number of female researchers is about is less, still less than less than 30 percent. And actually, this is an average number in some areas of the world is much much less than this. So we are paying a lot of attention for this. We need to address the gender gap in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We need to also to develop evidence-based integrated policy, and this can be done through robust science and the knowledge. So uh, we work in the natural science sector in uh, three different fields in order to contribute to uh, these uh, SDGs, some of the SDGs that you see here. Uh, uh, four is for education, and of course nine is more for the, in the innovative uh, new ways to respond to materials. To, um, uh, and we do this through uh, basic science and engineering, the technology. This is the, uh, inter the basically the, the science, the division that I'm part of, the science policy and basic science. Uh, for this, we have the uh, open science and we have the international basic science program and the uh, advancing science for sustainable management of natural resources, disaster risk reduction, and the climate change action. This is the ecology division. And the water division, of course, in order to improve knowledge and the strengthening capacities at all levels and achieve water security. These are the three main divisions uh, uh, in the natural science sector. I will start with the water. As you see here, the water is actually at the center of the SDGs. It's included in many different plans, as you see here, as it's related to climate change and related to many problems in the world. And if you see here, this, is, this looks a bit complicated, but actually these are the items under each of the SDGs, and you see they are all uh, connected to form this complicated network. So securing water is very important. We do this uh, through the uh, international intergovernmental hydrological uh, program. Uh, the hydrological program started uh, more than 42 years ago. It started as an uh, international program promoting collaboration in the, in the field of water. But you see it passed through all these stages until now and it developed itself a lot. So now it is actually an intergovernmental program and it's working on securing water, both ground and the surface water. And uh, this is done through collecting data, through helping member states to develop policies, uh, through technicalities as well. So we also offer technical uh, solutions to some uh, problems. So uh, this is a rich history of the international, of the intergovernmental hydrological program still uh, actively working until now. Uh, in, in the uh, ecology uh, division, uh, which is mainly responsible for biosphere reserves and also uh, the Geopark, uh, the Geopark program. <clears throat> we see here, these are some of the challenges we are facing now. 75% of the land area has been significantly altered negatively, impacting uh, the well-being of 3.2 million people around the world. Uh, about 90% of land is projected to be significant, significantly altered by 2050. 
uh, currently only 3% of the ocean is unaffected by human activities. You have 66% of the ocean area is experiencing increasing impacts. More than 85% of wetland area has been lost. You see, these are huge challenges and we really need to work hard in order to solve them. And this is done uh, via uh, our uh, um, uh, <coughs> inter, uh, the Geopark uh, uh, program is one of them and also the Man and Biosphere program. So now, as you see here, we have 1,154 uh, uh, 1, world heritage around the world, 218 natural, 39 mixed, and 42 transboundary. Uh, in the global geoparks, we have about 177 in 46 countries. This is covering about 6% of the total Earth area. And in the biosphere reserves, we have 727 biosphere reserves in 131 countries. Uh, this program works as laboratory for sustainable development. We work through this program to help the member states to address this program. We offer them capacity building and the training on how to preserve uh, these, uh, these areas, either the ocean or the geoparks or uh, the uh, natural heritage uh, 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 locations. So actually, UNESCO's unique network of designated sites provides solutions for addressing both climate change and biodiversity uh, and for sustainable uh, development action. <clears throat> uh, so the team, uh, there are three different teams actually working on all these three activities. Uh, I move now, and yeah, this is an example, the collaboration with the American uh, Geoscience uh, Institute. And this, this is what they can do in the, specifically in the Geopark International Program. So they can help in managing healthy soil and developing uh, energy for, to power uh, the nation. Uh, managing waste is very important, managing waste to maintain healthy environments and all these different activities. Um, also, one of the very important units at the natural science sector is the um, uh, disaster risk reduction. Uh, this is, as the name reflects, perhaps, it, uh, it contributes uh, uh, to all, actually, activities of UNESCO. So it's, uh, it's a very diverse uh, unit. It has to work with all the different sectors of UNESCO, uh, natural science, education, communication, culture, and so on, because disaster, when it happens, actually, it affects every, everyone in the world. So uh, it affects education, it affects science, it affects everything. So we need to be... Um, uh, really careful on, uh, on, on how to handle this uh, problem. So science technology, we do this through science technology innovation for resilience, uh, developing early warning systems, uh, built the environment, education and the school safety, um, uh, disaster, disaster risk reduction for cultures and different sites, ecosystem based disaster risk reduction, and also we work on post-disaster response when disasters happen, how to handle the situation afterwards. All this is done uh, in this uh, important unit. We also work, of course, with other international uh, organizations within the UN system. Uh, now I move to the third uh, division, which is uh, science policy and basic science. But actually, in my talk uh, later, I will give more details about this. Uh, so I will not mention a lot here. This is the International Basic Science Program. This program was established in 2005. Um, it's, it's advisory. It's, uh, it has a board that acts as advisory board for UNESCO in the field of, in the field of basic science. Uh, currently, uh, the, the, the current uh, board was reconstituted in September last year, 2021. It's, it has uh, 22 eminent scientists from everywhere in the world. The chair of the board now is uh, Dr. Mariam Shadid. She is an astronomer from France, <coughs> uh, originally from Morocco. Um, and actually, uh, the, 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 the board is, is very active in uh, advising us and giving us ideas in the field on how to build the capacities in the field of basic science. So we cover all these uh, science, basic science disciplines, physics, chemistry, uh, mathematics, and uh, STEM. We have a big STEM program that I will uh, talk about it in detail later. Uh, so, uh, also we have um, uh, one of the important uh, recent initiatives from UNESCO is the Open Science. You might have heard about uh, this initiative. It was approved, the uh, recommendations were approved uh, last November during the UNESCO General Conference. 
<clears throat> open science, um, uh, I know that there is a lot of debate about open science and people might have different definition for open science and they, may, they might argue <laughs> about the, the value of, of open science. However, we believe that open science has the potential to increasing quality of science, uh, making the entire scientific process more transparent, which is very important. This might lead to increasing uh, uh, or, or, or making science uh, as a critical accelerator for implementation of sustainable uh, development. <coughs> Okay, so it seems like I'm done. So uh, now there are a lot of meetings being uh, uh, done with the member states in order to discuss how to implement uh, the recommendation of uh, open science. Uh, last, last thing here is uh, the biggest problem we have right now, which is uh, that women remain minority in the field of science. Uh, still, less than 30% of women are in science, and this is a huge gap, and we need to close the gap. Please mind the gender gap. This video, if you uh, search for mind the gender gap, there is a very nice uh, short video done by UNESCO. I advise to, or I recommend that you watch it. And we are paying a lot of attention for this problem, and we are working hard in order to close the gap. Uh, close many gaps, actually, not only the gender gap. Uh, I finally uh, finish here uh, by uh, using this slogan from uh, our assistant. I'm sorry, our assistant director general of UNESCO for Natural Science, and uh, this is that basic science is the beating heart of sustainable development. So uh, we are trying to keep it as a beating heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Castri. The next speaker in, in this session is Dr. Michael Spiro, President of the Steering Committee of the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. Dr. Spiro, the floor is yours, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Amal, for this great presentation. Thanks to UNESCO for supporting the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. Thanks, Nebosha, for organizing, organizing this great event, which is uh, multidisciplinary and also which uh, uh, gather people from uh, the western part and the eastern part of Europe, which I think is great in this moment. Thank you very much. So uh, I will start my presentation by showing you a short video, two minutes, made by CERN. Uh, my grandniece, uh, Eloise Goldberg, 13 years old, starring in it. I hope you will enjoy it. I hope it will work. So let me start. <coughs> Projected in the So we start again. Sorry for this. Sir. Curiosity about the world around us is what makes us human. This desire to make sense of the world is the driving force behind fundamental science. Stirred by this curiosity, each new generation of scientists adds to the pool of knowledge built up by previous generations. We are at a crucial time for the future of our planet. Now, more than ever, it is imperative to use this pool of knowledge to help solve the global problems we face and pave the way for a more sustainable development. And we must not stop being curious. Future generations will be inspired by the knowledge we contribute today, equipping them with the powerful tools they need to build a better world. 
And here you will have the three slides with the statement of uh, the international year. I will come back to that um, later on. Okay, so you, are, you have already part of the rationale which was expressed in, in, the, in this video. I want also to mention that uh, uh, curiosity-driven sciences re-enchant re our world and make it worse to be uh, sustainable. Uh, basic sciences explore the soul of the universe. I think uh, there is no limit to growth for basic sciences, like for poetry and like for music. I don't want to challenge uh, the Club of Rome, but I think they would agree that there, is no, that there are no limits for basic sciences, for knowledge, poetry, and music. Uh, again, I, I, I elaborate a little bit more about uh, the rationale behind it. It's true that the serendipity plays a role uh, in curiosity-driven uh, sciences, and we need the long-term funding uh, to uh, achieve uh, discoveries which are not ex all, always expected. So you, you fund for something and you find something, uh, something else. Also, also, viewed from the past, basic sciences are the foundations of sciences and serve education. They facilitate open multicultural dialogue. This was well mentioned by, by uh, Amal Kastri in, in the previous uh, talk. There were many uh, uh, disciplinary international years, astronomy, physics, chemistry, mathematics, it is time to uh, advocate for uh, interdisciplinary basic sciences and also sustainable sciences uh, to, uh, to uh, be in phase with the uh, uh, agenda for 2030 of the sustainable goals. By the way, also 2022 is a year of celebration for several scientific unions uh, uh, and this is worth to note. So this international year was uh, supported um, and steered by 50 international unions and organizations, supported by 110 science academies, this academy, Serbian Academy, scientific networks and learned societies. And we got also the high patronage of uh, 31 Nobel laureates and field medalists. We got the support of UNESCO, obviously, uh, the World Science Forum, the Club of Rome, the Interparliamentary uh, Union, uh, these unions, organizations, academies, networks, and associations are the foundations for the success of the year and for further initiatives, like a decade maybe, uh, beyond this international year. This is a real asset. I would li not like this to disappear after one year. So here you can see the uh, steering committee, unions, and organizations. There are many. Uh, from everywhere. In particular, there is CERN and GINR. They are well, they are well represented in this uh, conference. So examples of what we mean, uh, basic sciences for sustainable development. Uh, you know them, but I want to, to remind you of that. Uh, vaccines and, tr and treatments, uh, uh, especially against COVID-19, are full of basic biology, DNA, RNA. Uh, uh, the web was born at CERN from the needs of fundamental science, and it was really a serendipitous uh, discovery. Google research uh, engine uh, came from a brilliant mathematical ID. Artificial intelligence relies on statistical methods. Cellular phones are full of quantum mechanics uh, with uh, integrated circu circuits, Wi-Fi, uh, code, and so on. GPS relies on uh, Einstein's theory of relativity and on the advancement of quantum atomic clocks. The uh, Genome Project has opened the way to gene therapies. PET scan and MRI are based on uh, antimatter physics and fundamental atomic uh, magnetism. Generation and storage of renewable energy depends on the advances in physics, chemistry, and materials uh, sciences. Reduction in poll pollution and green chemistry rely on basic advances in chemistry, and this is still to come. History of for IYBSSD 2022, it took five years to, to bring this to a reality. Uh, I made the proposal in January 2017 to the International Basic Sciences Program mentioned by Amal Kasri uh, of UNESCO. Uh, uh, I, we got the support from uh, UNESCO IBSP one year after. Uh, then we got a resolution adopted by the UNESCO General Assembly in November 2019. 
uh, we, had, we had got strong support of the World Science Forum, uh, the Interparliamentary Union, and the Club of Rome. And finally, the International Year was proclaimed by the 76th United Nations General Assembly on uh, December 2nd, 2021, so quite late at the last minute. This is why the uh, opening ceremony, uh, you will see it, took place only on July 8th, 2022 at UNESCO. And the closing ceremony is now foreseen for uh, October 6th, uh, 2023 at CERN. So, tentative list of topics, you can see uh, there are many. Uh, basic sciences are connected to multicultural dialogue and peace, to education and human development, to uh, women and more generally, more generally to equity, diversity and in inclusion. This is related to open sciences. Uh, it is related to innovation, economy and sustainability sciences. This is very important. This is a new field which is emerging uh, and which we have to develop. Uh, they are connected to health and life sciences, more generally to global challenges. Uh, basic science, sciences are like a global public good. They are connected also to big data and to hazards. So I told you that the uh, opening ceremony took place on uh, July 8, 2022. It was a great event with the attendance of uh, five uh, uh, ministers and uh, four Nobel laureates. Uh, the Club of Rome was very well represented with Mampela Ramfele. Uh, uh, there, were, there were many talks uh, about education, uh, about uh, advancement of basic sciences, about young people, about women in physics, in, in sciences. Uh, so this was really a, a, a great event. Uh, the closing ceremony, I, I, I told you, will be uh, on October 6, 2022. We expect uh, flagship events at least in, in each continent. So this is for Europe. Uh, I come back just from one flagship event in Asia, in Vietnam, on science, ethics, and human development. I will report on it, on the outcome. So the possible resulting action are uh, certainly in, 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 uh, in connection with uh, UNESCO uh, prom promoting open access publishing and open, open data, open software, open sciences. Uh, this is clearly uh, uh, one, uh, one action of, uh, of this international year. Promote equity, diversity, and inclusion into collaboration in basic sciences. Promote training and education to basic and sustainability sciences in developing countries. Connect scientists to the actors of sustainable development. Develop basic toolkits to support science-based de decision making. Decrease the environmental footprint of basic sciences and promote, in order to go further, a decade of basic sciences for sustainable development. There could be inside this decade two uh, uh, projects of the international year, one for science engagement and one on quantum science and technology. Statement of the year, so this was shown quickly, I repeat it. Basic sciences are curiosity and I inquiry driven. They are the foundations of education and the sources of discoveries which turn into applications. They can serve an inclusive sustainable development, improving global equity and well-being together with a healthy and lively planet. All together, education, discoveries, applications and inclusive sustainable development can also boost collaborative and open basic sciences. This is a virtuous, virtuous circle that we want to promote during this international year and after. To achieve this goal, we shall need you, teachers, scientists, the private sector, decision makers and society at large, to share this vision and act accordingly. Global challenges uh, with various approaches, uh, both component and system approach, local and global approach, short-term and long-term long -term approach, involving, involving the society at large, are a unique opportunity to build a better world, improve well-being beyond just consumering, target global equity and a lively and healthy planet. Following further the current international mobilization, laws and treaties should be enacted towards these goals, based on a dialogue between all stakeholders, including scientists. So, as I said, uh, we, last week there was a, a flagship event for Asia, uh, science, ethics and human development. The outcome uh, in one page is uh, written here, scientific knowledge, technology and innovation shape our lives, our Im imagination, our hopes, our fears. But beyond, it is a common uh, universal heritage. Every scientist, so here comes the ethics, 
every scientist through his or her institution, especially when supported by public funds, and even if his research is curiosity and inquiry driven, must try to best connect to the society and should have in mind how his or her activity and findings could impact the world. This is the responsibility, responsibility of each scientist and might be of interest for contributing to make it better and not worse. This means to bringing benefits to and improving well-being of society at large, to, to contributing to global equity, human dignity, and to a healthy and lively planet. On the other part, however, a scientist must be given the necessary funding and freedom to, and the right to collaborate with the other scientists in their field to conduct their research, science for peace, and to be listened to at all levels of decision-making and inspire that way the decision-makers and the society at large. I think science can inspire the society and for the global challenges this will be needed. We discuss the models of big science which could be inspiring the society. Also society. So you see this is a balance, a balancing act to ensure societies trust their scientists and, their, uh, and the knowledge they provide. So possible indicators of success uh, of this international year, number of events, uh, their geographical distribution, their participants, and their impact, uh, concrete commitments from government parliaments to appropriately funding basic sciences over the next decade, investments and programs on STEM and sustainability sciences education for young people, initiatives to build solid bridges between science policymakers and the rest of the society, in order to use evidence-based decisions for the solution of global problems. Mobilizing all forces of our sustainable development for global equity and a healthy, lively planet, using lessons from the models of mobilization of scientists in basic sciences. We can on, we count on all of you for organizing events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spiro. The last speaker in this session will be Mr. Gary Jacobs, President of the World Academy of Art and Science. Gary, please. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be back in this room almost three years from the date where we conducted the uh, fourth international conference on future education in collaboration with the Academy, uh, the Serbian Academy and uh, UNESCO and other distinguished collaborators, and it's a great pleasure to be back here today for the World Academy to be collaborating again with the Academy, with the Club of Rome, and UNESCO on this very important topic. I'd like to give a little historical perspective to this very important meeting at a time of crucial importance to the future of humanity. Science has been here, been around for thousands of years, but the formal science that we know today really was born during the Enlightenment and actually gained its present character only about during the Second World War. It's much newer than we think. Technology has been there, of course. We had the Industrial Revolution. We had great inventors for the steam engine, electricity, the airplane and automobile and other things, telephone and so many other things. But the idea that science is the central, most important instrument for the progress of humanity, the most powerful instrument, really became evident only during World War II. In 1939, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to President Roosevelt warning him about the dangers of the development of nuclear weapons, atomic weapons rather, uh, in Germany and the threat that represented to the Allied powers, which led to the 
establishment of what was called the Manhattan Project. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, especially the physicists. And the appointment of Robert Oppenheimer as the head of the Manhattan Project to develop a nuclear atomic weapon before anybody else did. And that, of course, we know the history after that at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Eight years later, the same person, same people, rather, stood up in front of the world and said, we have made a horrendous blunder. Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein put together what's known as the Russell-Einstein Manifesto. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it, which ended with the very moving words, remember your humanity and forget the rest. There were 11 members who signed that manifesto, including the two of them. Four or five of them went on some six years later to found the World Academy of Art and Science. In between, many things happened. In 19, that was 1954. In 1956, the first international conference on the relationship between science and human welfare was conducted in Washington, D.C. And at that conference, there was a call and a decision to found a World Academy of Art and Science. Today we take into we take as commonplace the idea of global cooperation of scientists. But the idea behind the founding of the Academy was not just international cooperation. It was to announce the responsibility of science for the future of humanity, something we just heard uh, uh, from our last speaker emphasizing today, that science must be tailored and directed to address the problems of humanity and promote human welfare, something we would take for granted. That led in 1960 to the founding of the Academy with, by Einstein and Russell and Robert Oppenheimer and Joe Rotblatt, who eventually won the Nobel Prize for his work against nuclear weapons. Oppenheimer went on to become persona non grata in the U.S., where he had been hailed as the most famous scientist of the, his period, considered a spy uh, by the government because he had the courage to denounce uh, the, the nuclear arms race. A later president of the academy, Harlan Cleveland, was sitting as assistant secretary of state under President Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and fortunately lived to tell the story of how close we came to nuclear Armageddon at that time. But nuclear weapons weren't the only problem that we had. We had great scientific discoveries, the antibiotics of the 40s, the Salk vaccine, polio vaccine, one of the founding members was jo of our academy was Jonas Salk. And who could, who could question the power and value of science under those circumstances? But one of the, out, the outcomes, one of the unanticipated consequences of the, this great human invention was an unprecedented population explosion which had not been foreseen and for which the world was not equipped. The introduction of science, technology for human well-being, when it was done in isolation, created, solved one problem to a remarkable extent. Birth, uh, 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 more, child mortality went way down, health improved, longevity improved, but we ended up with another problem. By 1965, FAO projected that 10 million lives would be lost in India in a year of drought, simply because there wasn't enough food production. That led to another great scientific development with Green Revolution. One of our, found, one of our members was there at the outset and considered the father of the Green Revolution in India. Uh, but what looked to be so good at that time, we never anticipated the environmental impacts of 
the wholesale application of a particular technology on the environment, on the use of pesticides and all of the, on the, the cutting down of the forest under the enormous consumption of water and so forth. I've spent many years hailing the discovery or the development of the Green Revolution, but like other great positive initiatives, it was a double-edged sword. And the question we face in the field of science today is, why this double-edged sword keeps coming back? Why those brilliant men who developed these weapons believing they were doing it to protect the future of democracy and freedom for people all over the world, and why after how many decades we thought it was all settled at the end of the Cold War, and 30 years later the nuclear genie is rearing its head again, and any single country, any single country that possessed a nuclear weapon could blackmail the rest of the world just the way it's being done today. It doesn't require a big superpower to do it. So what does this have to do with us? In 1956, when I was at the university in Berkeley in the 60s, Jacob, uh, we, we, were, we read Jacob Bronowski's famous book, Science and Human Values. It was take, we thought it was taken for granted <laughs> that, that, that science is necessarily a force for good in the world and that everybody was concerned with human values. But when we look in actual fact, science, the application and results of the science depend on the people who create it and the people who, of course, administer it. And the big science that we heard about last night in the interesting, very interesting discussion by our uh, friends at Club of Rome uh, mentioned how much science, big science, is governed by power. Power is governed by money, and it's governed by it's governed it's it's uh, it's it's moved and controlled by governments that are concerned that have. Uh, that have some security concerns, but not necessarily the security of people, the security of nation states and boundaries in a world that's become globalized. In 2013, we were invited by the United Nations office in Geneva to conduct a conference on what we called the need for a new paradigm. The topic was really about the global challenges which we heard Michael Spiza just speaking about, Spira, just a few minutes ago. Because in spite of these decade after decade of tremendous economic, technological, scientific, and educational advance, we still face today equal or, in many respects, greater challenges than we did half a century or more ago, in spite of all our modernity, in spite of all our accomplishments. And we looked at the full range of global challenges in, the, in 2013, and we find they're all back here again today, except the nuclear genie, we thought it kind of receded. The idea of war in Europe was absurd at that time. And though climate change had been around for a little while, or for some time, it wasn't taken as seriously uh, as uh, then as it was now, in spite of the fact that a member of our board was uh, Regenta Pachuri was the chairman of the IPCC and was doing everything he could, along with the Club of Rome and others, to say how serious this is. What does all this mean? We saw in the last three years, I couldn't come back to Belgrade after 2019 because we were hit by a global crisis, a major security crisis, a human security crisis that stopped, virtually challenged, challenged everything we're doing in the world. It closed our schools, it closed our businesses, it closed our shops, it stopped our, our transportation, if not our communication. Uh, it impacted people all over the world. What good were the national defense budgets? What good were the military budgets to protect national boundaries? for a tiny little micro we couldn't even see, which was running havoc all over the world and taking up the superpower from which I come, <laughs> making it the worst target 
Uh, and the highest fatality rates, we're still not recovering our birth uh, rates to the, or our population to the level it was before. This would be a global tragedy if it had been done with weapons of mass destruction or anything, but it's been done anyway. And now we have the war that's going on very close to the borders here, bringing back the mentality we thought we had outgrown 30 years ago. Challenging not only war and the danger of the use of nuclear weapons, we now know the, the, econo the environmental impact of those would be far greater than any destruction was that done with physically to people or cities or infrastructure. Because it could literally create a blanket that accelerated global warming uh, for decades uh, and we would be helpless to do anything about it. So, what is, the, what, is, what is our responsibility? For years and years, scientists have thought in, in, all, in all respects, I do my job, I do my science, I'm questing for knowledge and everything. But the world keeps going on and now scientists are still rated as the most admired profession in the, in the world according to recent surveys at the global level. But yet, how much confidence can we have in the science that we're practicing today? I, we fully at the Academy support the, the, the reference to the basic sciences and what we can do to support human welfare and well-being. But is that enough, is my question, is the challenge we all face. Because the challenges we face as humanity, I'm not speaking in doom and gloom, uh, we've seen a lot of things in the past, but are we really closer to coming beyond, going beyond them? We had a conference here in this room three years ago arguing we need a new paradigm in education in the world. And I was happy to hear the references to interdisciplinarity and even transdisciplinarity because knowledge, reality is not in small boxes. We, have a, a, we teach more than a thousand disciplines and sub-disciplines in colleges and universities in the United States. We are very good at producing experts who know something very well in detail, but don't understand the big picture of how everything is connected to everything else. We collaborated with IEEE on a conference on artificial intelligence, and we had the leaders of IEEE uh, on this in the room, and we asked them, how much are your engineers learning about the society in which this artificial intelligence is being applied? To the people and the psychology of the people. To the impact of it on the society. Can we separate, can we afford to separate the technical knowledge from the social knowledge and the psychological knowledge necessary and the ecological knowledge necessary to know the impact. We have an educational system that thrives on specialization at a time when we really need people who understand the big picture. And I think everybody needs to understand the big picture. We have this 15, the 17 SDGs, which are a tremendous advance for humanity, no question about it. And uh, I met with Ban Ki-moon a few years ago because he was he presided over the formulation and introduction of the SDGs. And I said, you know, the only problem is when you talk to the people who are implementing them, who are studying them and everything, we divide it into 17 airtight compartments and each one is working on a specialized, we have special goals, we have 169 specialized targets, we have specialized research, we have specialized lawmaking on, on policy making. We have specialized ex agencies for implementation. And even our civil society is divided into so many specializations that, uh, that the different uh, NGOs don't talk to each other. But the world doesn't work that way. Last night we heard uh, Ugo uh, Barty and, uh, and my, my close friend Carlos Ferreira uh, talking about the need for an epistemological and human revolution. That's a big 
mouth to swallow. <laughs> That's a big idea to swallow now. We at the Academy absolutely believe that nothing short of that is going to solve the problems. If we solve this problem with a scientific technological solution, we're going to find we have three more later because our reality, our way of thinking is fragmented. Our education is fragmented, but reality isn't. And that's very difficult to say to distinguished professors and scientists who have been working and doing wonderful research in specific fields and to universities that are ranked so high because of the excellent departments of specialized expertise they have. And I don't question any of that, but it's not enough. And for the general population, it's, it's not enough either, not just for the specialists, not just for the scientists. We have to be equipping people to understand this world. It's more complex than any time in history. Our idea of security, the UN brought this idea up in 1994, Mabo al-Haq, in a report of UNDP on security, calling for a change in thinking about security from just looking, regarding it as na national security to human security. Security that puts the human being at the center, that talks to all of us. Most of the people in the world don't understand the importance of the multilateral institutions because they think it's all about nation states. But the real work of the multilateral institutions is to enforce, protect the rights of individual human beings and the fair treatment of people all over the world. And we don't have any other institutions in the world that can do that on a global basis. We need them, but the people don't understand that. And the education they're getting doesn't understand that. We're planning for the sixth International Educational Conference on Future Education in January on the theme of human security, education for human security, which doesn't invent something new. It takes all the 17 SDGs. It takes all the wonderful work in technology. We're collaborating with the Consumer Technology Association of America, that's the top technology firms uh, in, in the world, uh, from all over the world, on how technology can be targeted specifically to focus on enhancing human beings, whether it's bringing banking to the poor or communication and education to the poor or whatever it is, uh, to focus what should be obvious to us. The greatness of science should be measured not by the power of what it produces, but by the impact it has on the world. In academia, we think that we've joined an academic institution. Our job is to do research. Our job is to talk, to think creatively and invent what hasn't been invented, knowledge for knowledge's sake. But do we have that luxury today? The founders of the Academy and many others at the time concluded so many years ago, in the mid-50s, we don't have that luxury anymore but the paradigm hasn't yet changed. The Academy, I'm delighted to be participating in this and to listening to all the distinguished scholars and the work that's being done. But I hope that by through this effort and through the effort of this international year of basic sciences for sustainability, we can really do what Michelle was referring to. We can really bring together science, the power of science and the power of human welfare and human security so that we really get the one side of the sword that we really need most, which is peace, security, and well-being for all. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. With this talk, the introductory se se session of the conference has been completed.